Hello, and welcome to the TI Precision Lab series on humidity sensors. My name is Brandon Fisher, and I'm an applications engineer in the temperature and humidity sensing product line. In this video, we will cover the important physical values related to humidity sensing, and discuss the principles of operation behind a few different kinds of humidity sensors that you may encounter. Psychometry is a subset of hygrometry, and refers to the study of moisture content in the atmosphere. Before getting into how humidity sensors work, we will cover a few terms that are used in basic psychrometry and how to obtain those values. Relative humidity, or RH, is the ratio of H2O vapor pressure to H2O saturation vapor pressure for the current temperature and is typically expressed in percent. Relative humidity gives us an idea of how close the air is to being completely saturated with water vapor. When the amount of water in the air is constant, the RH value will change as temperature changes. The term saturation vapor pressure, PWS in this equation, describes the pressure exerted by a vapor, in our case H2O, in thermodynamic equilibrium at a given temperature. It is a known value for water and atmosphere at any given temperature, and represents the maximum amount of water that air can hold before condensation occurs. The term vapor pressure describes the actual pressure of water vapor in the atmosphere, and does not require equilibrium. Please note that in some discussion, in other disciplines, this term is used equivalently to saturation vapor pressure. In discussions of psychrometry, these two values are distinct. In contrast with relative humidity, absolute humidity is independent of temperature and is a measurement of the mass of water vapor per some volume of air. Most commonly, this is presented in grams per cubic meter. More often when using RH sensors, you will find the value of relative humidity and from that you will find vapor pressure and then absolute humidity. The second relationship shown here can be used to find the value of absolute humidity when the vapor pressure is already known. Dew point is another commonly measured value within hygrometers and reflects the temperature at which, assuming the moisture content of air remained constant, condensation would begin to form. As a rule, the dew point is always lower than the current ambient air temperature. Similar to relative humidity and absolute humidity, Mixing ratio is another method of looking at the amount of water vapor in air and expresses the mass of water vapor per mass of dry air. Enthalpy is actually a measure of the amount of heat energy stored in ambient air, given either in joules per kilogram or in BTU per pounds. This value is commonly used in HVAC systems, where we may want to exchange air between two points efficiently to cool or heat an area. Finally, we have dry bulb temperature, which is the temperature measured at a thermometer when it is shielded from radiation. This is often considered to be true ambient air temperature. Similarly, wet bulb temperature is a temperature measured at a thermometer wrapped in a wet cloth. The moisture allows evaporative cooling to occur on this thermometer, resulting in a temperature typically lower than the dry bulb temperature. We will cover these two quantities a little bit more when we discuss psychrometers. A psychrometric chart shows the relationship between the parameters we just defined. The x-axis typically displays the dry bulb temperature, and the y-axis displays humidity mixing ratio. Additional values such as dew point, vapor pressure, enthalpy, absolute humidity, and relative humidity may or may not be displayed depending on the specific chart. For any psychrometric chart, knowing any two parameters will allow you to locate a position on the curve that corresponds with all other labeled values. Looking at the whole chart, you may also notice that the relationship between the amount of water vapor that ambient air can hold and the air temperature is exponential. In other words, at very low temperatures, the amount of water vapor that could be contained in air is extremely small. This makes the relative humidity curves, shown in red on this chart, much closer at low temperatures, and much more spread at higher temperatures. This compression makes it difficult for many humidity sensors to work well at low temperature. So once you have any two values that appear in that psychometric chart, you can use them to find other important psychometric values. In order to get these first two values, though, engineers and scientists need some way to actually measure them. We'll discuss a few different ways of measuring atmospheric moisture, but we'll start with a traditional dry bulb, wet bulb psychrometer. As the name implies, this tool starts with a dry bulb thermometer, which is typically shielded in some way from radiation, and a wet bulb thermometer, which is wrapped in a cotton wick or sock that is wet in order to allow the effects of evaporative cooling to take place. Because one of these thermometers is being cooled by the evaporation of moisture and one is not, there will be a measurable temperature difference between the two. 
One drawback of this style of humidity sensor is that because the wet bulb thermometer is relying on evaporative cooling, external environmental factors such as the atmospheric pressure can cause inconsistent readings. It is also true that if two thermometers have an accuracy difference to begin with, that will show up as an error in their final RH measurement after conversion. Assuming those parameters are well controlled for, knowing each of these temperatures can allow us to find the relative humidity, absolute humidity, or by extension any other psychometric value by using the psychometric chart. Alternatively, these type of dry bulb, wet bulb psychrometers also have an empirical relationship with vapor pressure. There are a few different forms that we can use including the Farrell equation, the Apjohn equation, or the Carrier equation. These equations include slightly different constants and forms, which encompass the specific effects like those of pressure and construction that are inherent to those specific designs. In general though, we can say that the atmospheric vapor pressure as measured by these psychrometers is the saturation vapor pressure at wet bulb temperature, modified by some function f, which is dependent on pressure, dry bulb temperature, and wet bulb temperature. This function f also always goes to zero as T becomes equal to Tw. In other words, when the air is completely saturated, the dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures are equivalent. The air in this scenario is at 100% humidity, and evaporative cooling cannot change the temperature of the wet bulb thermometer. The theory behind psychrometers of this style is over 150 years old, but there are still many of these designs in use in laboratory and field settings today, including variants such as sling psychrometers that we will not discuss here. In general, these psychrometers have a few key advantages when compared to modern humidity sensors. Because they can rely on physical measurements of temperature, such as with a mercury thermometer, some designs require no power to operate. They also work across a wide temperature range, and the complete 0 to 100% RH range. They have no drift, assuming the physical conditions of the tool go unchanged, and they present very little hysteresis in reading. On the downside, these tools are complex and expensive. A new design requires a great deal of characterization, and the thermometers must be high precision to avoid contributing unacceptable error to the final measurement. They also require regular maintenance to prevent their condition from affecting reading results. A more modern and very common type of integrated circuit humidity sensor is a resistive humidity sensor. These sensors are relative humidity transducers, meaning that unlike the dry bulb, wet bulb psychrometers that we just discussed, they translate relative humidity directly into an electrical quantity that can be measured. The image on the left shows an example of a resistive humidity sensor layout. In this top-down view, starting from the top and working into the device, we have the protective cover, which was left transparent in this image, this shields the sensor from direct contact with moisture, UV, and chemicals. Underneath that, we have the sensing vent film. This is a material that changes its electrical resistivity based on the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. Sharing a level with the sensing thin film, we have two separate interdigitated electrodes, and underneath that is a substrate that the sensor is designed on top of. Here is a cross-section of what this stack up looks like in this type of resistive sensor. When an electrical signal is applied between these two nodes, the resistance between the electrodes and through the sensing film can be measured. The resistance value will change across RH, allowing the user to translate between the resistance and atmospheric relative humidity. The shape and scale of this curve can change a lot depending on the parameters such as the electrode design and the type of sensing film used. In general though, regardless of the design, the resistance that is output will be dependent on the frequency of the excitation signal and the atmospheric temperature. In many cases, designers will also include a thermistor or external temperature sensor to compensate for temperature. Additional external circuitry may also be included to sample and linearize the output curve of these sensors. In that case, the output could be an analog voltage or even digital, though the sensing element itself is still resistive. Because these resistive humidity sensors are much more easily mass produced than psychrometers, they are typically very low cost. These can also be easily swapped in the field, especially when the linearization is handled by additional integrated circuitry and temperature compensation is already provided. These sensors do have a limited range of effectiveness, including difficulty returning an accurate reading at lower RH conditions. As mentioned, they have a strong dependence on ambient temperature and excitation frequency. Additionally, they are sensitive to contamination by chemicals, so they must be cleaned and manufactured carefully. They also have poor stability under constant conditions. In part, the stability issue is due to resistive self-heating during device sampling and can be mitigated with proper sampling techniques and characterization. 
The final sensor type we'll discuss are capacitive sensors. These are the most common integrated circuit style humidity sensors, and they are exclusively the kind we produce at Texas Instruments. In its simplest form, a capacitive humidity sensor can be thought of as just a parallel plate capacitor. A humidity sensor polymer is sandwiched between two electrodes, and as RH changes, the dielectric constant of the polymer changes. This alters the capacitance of the system. Similar to resistive sensors, by measuring this capacitance, we can determine the relative humidity value. In reality, capacitive style humidity sensors don't look much like the parallel plate capacitor on the last slide. Instead, they include a sensing polymer coated on top of a silicon dot. In this example, we have a cross section of an IC humidity sensor inside a typical leadless, dual-sided SMT package. A thermal pad provides additional contact reliability and a more direct thermal path to the die, and bottom wires provide electrical connection and a thermal path to the pins. Unlike most IC packages, though, these types of designs have an opening at the top of the mold compound to expose the sensing polymer to the open air. This allows moisture to freely exchange between the polymer and the atmosphere so that RH can be accurately measured. Without this opening, RH measurements would not be possible. A more realistic view of how these kinds of capacitive RH sensors may be implemented is given here. In this design style, two electrodes are enclosed within an insulative dielectric, in this case above a common ground plane. The polymer is above these electrodes, separated by an additional passive layer. When active, there is an electric field and an associated capacitance that exists between these two electrodes, shown in green, and between each electrode and ground, shown in red. These lines show the portion of capacitance which is not dependent on RH, as they do not extend to the sensing polymer. It is the fringe field lines which actually cross through the sensing polymer that are affected by the change in electrical permittivity of the polymer over RH. This kind of topology has a more complicated relationship than our ideal parallel plate capacitor example, but it is easier to manufacture for integrated circuits. Similar to resistive style sensors, over RH the capacitance of these sensors will change predictably, and we can work backwards to obtain the RH value once the capacitance is measured. The measured capacitance value is also dependent on changes in excitation frequency and in the temperature of the die. In most cases, these kinds of capacitive style sensors will include an integrated temperature sensor that can be used to compensate for device temperature and improve accuracy. In general, capacitive sensors are similarly low in cost to resistive humidity sensors. They have good functional humidity range from 0 to 100 percent and very small hysteresis, typically 1 percent or below. They also provide a very fast response time to steep changes in humidity. Among the drawbacks of these sensors is that they typically have poor accuracy below 5% RH and require additional complex circuitry and characterization to sample capacitance and convert it back to relative humidity. Additionally, due to the opening at the top of the package, these sensor types are sensitive to exposure to chemicals and require special consideration in manufacturing. So we understand now how these sensors work and hopefully the relationship between the parameters that they measure. How can this information be useful in a real application? Let's consider the case of a thermostat which displays and measures both temperature and humidity. The temperature of the room is 25 degrees C, but the unit is displaying 26 C. Inside the case is a humidity sensor mounted on a PCB with a surrounding cutout to reduce thermal mass. If the case has insufficient airflow, it is possible that other devices, such as the LCD display, or a controller mounted on the board may be generating enough heat to cause the temperature inside the case to be higher than the temperature outside. Now in our code, we can simply apply a 1 degree C offset to our temperature reading to correct the display, but relative humidity is also dependent on temperature. How can we correct RH? Well, let's begin with the assumption that although temperature is different, the amount of water in the air is the same. In other words, the absolute humidity inside the case is the same as the ambient absolute humidity. We also know the relationship for absolute humidity, and for simplicity we can use the constant C to replace other constant values. We can substitute in our relationship for absolute humidity based on vapor pressure, and use the definition of relative humidity to eliminate vapor pressure and get this equation in terms of relative humidities. With one last step of simplification, we can determine the ambient relative humidity value using saturation vapor pressures, the ratio of both the ambient and case temperatures, and the relative humidity as measured at the sensor. All of these are known values in this scenario. Using this equation, we can calculate the ambient RH and correct the display on our thermostat accordingly. With that example, we'll conclude this video. You should now have some useful knowledge of psychrometry and the physics behind humidity sensing. Thank you for watching. 
please try the quiz to check your understanding of the content. For more information and videos on humidity sensors, please visit ti.com forward slash humidity.